Okay, hi, uh, I'm Lane Kenworthy. Uh, I'm giving a sort of a summary talk on uh, cross-national data on income inequality and data and evidence, I should say, and what we know. It's gonna be very much a summary. This is way, way too big a topic to cover in a short amount of time, um, but let's start right in. Um, okay. I'm gonna, we now, one of the nice things about uh, data availability nowadays is that we're getting it for more and more countries. Although for a lot of these countries, the, the time series are pretty short. I'm gonna just focus on uh, 20 or so rich uh, countries that have been democratic for a reasonably long amount of time. So countries that I think it's pretty reasonable to, to compare with one another. Um, income inequality, data come in in two forms these days. One has to do with inequality between those at the very top and everyone else. Uh, these are fairly new data. This is a, a function of the last 15 years or so. The data come from tax records. They're available for a couple of countries, I think prior to 1900. But for most countries, the, the data go back to somewhere in the early 1900s. It's essentially whenever a country uh, instituted a, a national income tax and began keeping good records that social scientists can now mine for uh, for data on this. The data, when we're comparing across countries, are almost always pre-tax. The ones I'm going to show you are solely pre-tax. Uh, that's because we don't have comparable data um, where income tax payments are are subtracted. Um, and these data come largely from the World Inequality Database, uh, assembled, uh, compiled by Toma Piketty and his collaborators. Um, tax record data are better than the other source of data, household survey data, on information for those at the very top. Um, Luxembourg income study data, along with those from the OECD, and Frederick Solt has uh, compiled these and tried to standardize them in a database he calls the Standardized World Income Inequality database focusing on uh, uh, and extrapolating from the Luxembourg income study data which are considered the gold standard here. So these household survey data are good uh, for most of the population but not those at the tip top because they tend to be top coded. Uh, people in surveys with very high incomes tend to refuse to give their income information and so uh, surveyors have found it's better if you promise them you won't report the, the full income uh, and so while these data are quite good for most of the population, they leave out those at the top. The tax record data are better, not perfect, but better for those at the, at the tip top. Not so great below that. Um, and so researchers tend to rely on the tax record data when, we're, our, when our inequality interest is in something like the share of income going to the top 1% or inequality between those at the top and everyone else. If we want to understand inequality within, roughly speaking, the bottom 99%, we, we focus on the household survey data. Those are available for the United States going back to about 1947, 48, but for most other countries um, only in 1960 or, or even later for, uh, for some. Even, even these rich democratic countries, which tend to have quite good data collection practices, uh, we still don't have very lengthy time series coming from household surveys. These data, um, in most cases, uh, take into account government transfers. That is to say, incomes are measured with government, all types of government transfers included, or almost all, and with uh, most types of taxes subtracted. Uh, and again, these data come first and foremost from LIS, but also the OECD provides some and, uh, and Frederick Soltz database. There are others as well, but Frederick Soltz database is, uh, is good at filling in the, the cracks. The list data, as you know, come in originally five-year intervals, then four, and now down to three-year intervals for, for many countries. Okay, let's turn to trends and, and causes. Here's a picture of uh, the standard measure of inequality between those at the top and everyone else. That's the share of income that's going to the top 1%. Again, pre-tax and for comparability across country, these are data that exclude capital gains. Uh, both of those things, the pre-tax element and the exclusion of capital gains can be problematic, but this is the best we can do. And you can see that the, the story is steadily declining inequality. So higher on the vertical axis here is more inequality. 
uh, steadily declining inequality until around uh, the end of the 1970s. The exact point differs depending on the country, but roughly speaking, we see a pretty common pattern. Um, so this is showing all 21 of those rich, long-standing democratic nations. I've highlighted the United States and also the four Nordic countries. I'll come back to the, the reason for that. Not so much because they're exceptional, although the United States very much is exceptional here, at least in the, the period since the late 1970s, which is one of uh, a reversal of the trend. So we've seen a rise in inequality, but it's been uh, much more rapid, much starker in the United States than, than anywhere else. Uh, so you can see the distance between the US and the other countries uh, was uh, not all that great in 1979. It's now, uh, it's not quite large. Um, what happens if we try to take into account uh, taxes and all types of government transfers? So uh, Piketty, Saez, and uh, Gabriel Zuckman have tried to do this with data for the United States. And this is the, the picture that you, you get. So the, the U-shaped or V-shaped pattern of declining inequality and then rising inequality with, uh, by the most recent years, um, the United States essentially uh, reaching once again the very high level of inequality that we had in the early part of the, the 1900s. You can see that here. It, uh, a similar pattern appears when we look at post transfer post tax data, although the, the rise has been not quite as large. Um, this, this tells us two things. Uh, we don't have data like this for most of these other countries. That's why I'm only showing the United States here. It tells us two things. Um, one is that most of the action here is in what we might call market uh, income inequality, which is affected by things that government does. Um, but uh, when we're not including transfers and taxes anyway, the fiscal operations of government, at least the direct or immediate fiscal operations of government, um, we can see that, that, that it's, it's what's going on in the, the market that's driving most of the trend in, in inequality. But another thing we see is that uh, government did help at least a little bit, not very much, but a little bit to ameliorate or, or reduce the, the rise in inequality. The difference here at the end of the period is a little greater than the difference at the beginning. In percentage terms, it's not really a, a whole lot of difference, but in terms of, um, of the share of income, the absolute share of income going to the top 1%, um, government seems to have helped despite um, the very commonly referenced changes in, uh, in taxes. Okay, let's um, turn to causes. And here the, the story is uh, often portrayed as a very simple one. Um, so for example, you, you often run into accounts that say this is entirely a story of globalization or it's entirely a story of changes in top end tax rates or maybe entirely a story of union decline or financialization. Um, my sense here, and there's a, a, an additional reading which you can go to if you wanna uh, see my view on this in greater depth, but my sense is that those, each of those stories is too simplistic. Um, I'm pretty convinced that no one of the seven factors, causal factors that you see listed on this slide here, um, accounts for, let's say, 50% or more of the, the uh, pattern of declining uh, top-end income inequality from the early part of the 1900s through the, the mid to late 1970s, or the, the rise since then in most of these countries, or the variation between uh, nations in the level of inequality at any given point in time. I think this is a more complex, multifaceted story. I think we have a long way to go in terms of nailing down the precise contribution of, of any one of these factors. And there may be more going on than is listed here. Um, but my, my uh, simple version of this story is that it's actually pretty complex. Uh, and I, I'll, one other thing I'll mention here is that I'm less convinced than some of uh, the impact of uh, the third factor listed here, the market power of large firms, and also the reduction in, uh, in top tax rates. It's not that I don't think they matter at all, but uh, um, my sense is that those have tended to get a lot of play in the, the causal storytelling in recent years, and, and I'm, um, I'm not so convinced that they've been major players here. 
Okay, let's turn now to the household survey data. And again, this is giving us a sense of income inequality, mainly within the bottom 99%, because usually uh, what's going on in the top 1%, roughly speaking, uh, those data are lost when we, when we top code uh, the information from the household surveys. The data don't go nearly as far back in time. I've intentionally included a lot of white space over on the left-hand side of this graph here, just to, to call your attention to the fact that we simply don't have uh, data for, for most of these countries and comparable data really for any of the countries going back prior to about 1960 or so. Um, but you can see something uh, similar in terms of the trends for countries where data are available in the 1960s and 1970s, we tend to see a decline in income inequality. By the way, the measure here is the Gini coefficient. I'm not going to bother to explain that. You're probably familiar. And if not, you can, you can look it up pretty quickly and easily. Higher numbers, again, are more inequality here. Uh, and then after 1979, once again, we see rising income inequality in many, not all, but, uh, but many of these countries, including the, the very egalitarian Nordic nations. Their levels of income inequality tend to remain down near the, the bottom, that is to say, they, they tend still to have the lowest amounts. Um, but they, they, like the United States and uh, a number of other nations, have experienced increases in inequality within the, the bottom 99% over this period of the last four decades or so. This uh, chart here um, adds in information on pre-tax, pre-transfer income inequality. So I should have mentioned that the, the previous chart, I'll just go back to that. This is for post-transfer, post-tax income inequality or disposable income inequality as it's often called. Uh, so after pretty much everything is, uh, is taken into account. Um, this chart shows the pre-tax, pre-transfer trends for just two of the countries, uh, two that are kind of at polar opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of the levels of inequality in the United States, which is at the high end, of course, in Sweden, which tends to be among the, the nations with the lowest levels of, of income inequality. One of the interesting things you can see is that that uh, picture is mostly a story of what's happened after 1960 or so. So these data begin in 1960. Um, and it's also mostly a function of what the, the government does. So um, in around 1960, pre-transfer pre-tax income inequality, the Gini coefficient was actually higher in Sweden than in the United States. Now that's partly a story of what's going on among the elderly. So in nations where pensions are quite comprehensive and very generous, um, people tend to save less during their working years, uh, and they also demand and rely less on generous company pensions because they know that they're going to get a good, uh, solid uh, pension from the state, from the government once they retire. And so that yields a lot of people with very low market or pre-tax, pre-transfer incomes once they reach retirement age. And that, that bumps up the, the Gini coefficient. Uh, but it's not the only story. Um, in any event, uh, what you see is the pre-transfer, pre-tax inequality is pretty similar beginning around 1980 or so, pretty similar in the two countries. And it trends in a, a similar direction. But once we add in government transfers and subtract taxes, uh, Sweden's Gini coefficient drops way down below that of the United States. Although, uh, uh, like in the previous picture, you, you see here that it's been rising and at about the same pace uh, as in the United States. So much lower level of income inequality in Sweden than in the US, but, uh, but similar trend in the, the last four decades or so. We can disaggregate, and it's helpful to do this, uh, disaggregate inequality within the bottom 99% um, uh, and look separately at what's going on within the, the top half and what's going on within the bottom half. So this chart looks at a, a pretty commonly used familiar measure of income inequality within the top half. Doesn't go quite to the top, so this is um, income at the 90th percentile, let's call that the upper middle class, maybe the top of the upper middle class, uh, divided by income at the 50th percentile, at the medium. So that's middle of the middle class, probably. Um, uh, higher numbers, again, on the vertical axis, again, indicate more inequality. Uh, 
Um, you can see that the United States uh, only recently has jumped ahead of all of the other countries. There were several others uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s even that had similar levels of inequality here between the, the upper middle class and the middle. Uh, but the United States now has the, the highest level of inequality. And it's had a trend of, uh, of a significant rise in income inequality. What that comes from is households uh, in the upper middle, those are college graduates or those with more than a college degree, uh, seeing pretty solid increases in income, whereas those in the middle of the middle, right at the median, have seen rising income since 1979 or so, but, uh, but pretty slow, slowly rising incomes. Uh, in other countries, there's been more of a balance. Uh, so in, in some of these countries, you do see a rise in the 90-50 or the ratio, the P90 to P50 ratio, but, uh, but not as rapid as in the United States. Uh, and once again, uh, significant variation in, uh, in levels of income inequality. What are the, the main causes here? Um, I, I think the story tends to be mainly about wage, or we could call this pay inequality, so it's wages and salaries, um, with the Nordic countries, for example, at the bottom, where unions have historically been quite strong and remain strong, playing a very prominent role here and an important part of the union strategy in the Nordic countries, especially Sweden, but the others as well, has been not only to bring up wages at the bottom, but also to compress wages between those in the upper middle. They, they tend to have relatively little impact on those at the tip top, but certainly the upper middle, uh, so engineers, uh, maybe middle and upper level management in, uh, in a lot of companies, college professors, those types of, of people and those in the, the middle of the middle. They've been in favor of wage compression or, or pay compression and succeeded in, uh, in getting that. So wage inequality is an important part of the story here, but also employment patterns. Uh, so there are big differences in levels of income and also trends in income uh, between households that have two adults where both are employed and, and that's been a, a steadily increasing trend over time versus those with only one adult or where only one is employed, uh, and especially uh, compared to those where there's no one uh, employed. That includes many retired households, of course, but, uh, but others as well. And then marital homogamy has been, a, been a, a growing or increasing phenomenon in many of these countries, whereby people with similar levels of, uh, of education, for example, or similar labor market skills, uh, incre are increasingly likely to couple with one another and that yields uh, not only more and more two earner households, but uh, more and more two high earner households and that can, can raise inequality. Okay, what about inequality in the, the lower half of the distribution? So here uh, a common measure is the 50-10 ratio. So that's the median uh, income of the median household divided by the income of a household at the 10th percentile, so down near the bottom. Uh, we tend to worry a bit about data quality for reporting reasons once we go below the 10th percentile, so it's, it's not quite at the bottom, but it's a pretty good proxy for what's going on at the bottom. Um, and here you can see, once again, the United States is at the top, although joined uh, recently by uh, South Korea and Spain, at the top meaning the highest level of, uh, of inequality. But interestingly, not much change in the United States in uh, inequality in the lower half of the distribution. And that's mainly because, uh, as I said before, incomes in the middle of the middle, so at the median, have been growing, but quite slowly. Incomes at the bottom have also been growing. So except at the very, very bottom, which isn't captured at the 10th percentile, it's not the case that incomes have dropped or stagnated in the United States. Uh, they've risen mainly as a function of rising government benefits of Social Security, but also the Earned Income Tax Credit, disability payments, uh, and some others. Um, not very rapidly, to be sure, but they have grown a little bit. So the, the rate of increase at the bottom in the United States, or again, at least at the 10th percentile, has been pretty similar to the rate of increase in incomes at the, the middle. So you see very little change in the ratio. Uh, that's been true of many of these countries. There are a few where there's been a rise, uh, and uh, even in the Nordic countries, which once again are, uh, have uh, among the, the lowest levels of, of inequality for not surprising reasons. Unions in those countries are, are quite strong and tend to drive up pay uh, 
uh, at the floor. There's no statutory minimum wage in this country because they don't need it and unions don't want it. Uh, unions have been able to bargain successfully for a, a quite high wage floor. Um, but it, it has been the case that incomes at the median have been rising a little more rapidly in most of the Nordic countries than they have uh, at the bottom. And so you see a little bit of a rise in, in the income inequality. But for many of these countries, the story is a small rise or a, a flat trend, uh, like in the United States. Uh, three main factors contributing to both the, the variation across countries and the change over time, not surprisingly there, wage inequality and then employment and household structure, uh, which I mentioned before. Those are the two sources of uh, uh, market incomes, uh, what your, your wage level is, and also whether you have a job and how much uh, you're working. And when, we, when we're looking at households, how many people in the, the household have paying jobs. Uh, and then very importantly, government benefits, for, uh, especially for those at the bottom. This has a little bit of an impact at the middle, particularly with things like pensions and unemployment insurance, sickness insurance as well. Uh, but it's a more important contributor to, to incomes and income trends at the bottom. Okay, quick summary of uh, trends and causes. Uh, in most nations, as I uh, said in the, the charts that you looked at, showed declining income inequality from the early 1900s. Uh, probably right before World War I, when many countries began to institute uh, federal income taxes. At the very least, uh, likely since the 1930s, when, uh, when the first big expansion of welfare states and government redistributive uh, programs came into play. Uh, and this continues to until around uh, the end of the 1970s, 1979 and 1980, a little bit later in a few other countries. But since then, the trend has been uh, flat in a few countries, but in most, there's been rising income inequality. And that's true whether we're talking about inequality between those at the top and everyone else, so top 1% share measure, or whether we're talking about inequality within the, the bottom 99% measured with a Gini coefficient or a 90-50 ratio or a 50-10 ratio or, or some other measure. Uh, there's quite considerable variation across this otherwise relatively similar group of, of Countries, all affluent, all democratic for at least the last 40 years or so. Uh, and some variation uh, in the, the trends over time. The causal story is in some ways fairly simple. Um, some very familiar factors have clearly mattered. Union strength, uh, government taxes, government transfers, probably globalization and financialization, but at, at the same time, the causal story is, is less simple than is sometimes portrayed, or than perhaps policymakers, many policymakers would wish. It would be nice if there were a, a fairly simple causal story, be, be at least in principle easier to fix. Um, but so at the same time that there have been common trends and common causes, there's a lot of interesting country specific, or if you want group specific, regime, regime type specific, uh, stories that I've, I haven't gone into at all simply because of uh, lack of time in this, this talk, this presentation. There are loads and loads of, uh, of interesting st stories to tell uh, for particular time periods or contrasting and comparing uh, across nations. Okay, let me uh, now, in the little bit of time left, a uh, little bit of time I have left, uh, turn to this question, um, should reducing income inequality be a, a high priority? Um, I have tended to think that it should. In fact, I, I wrote two books, um, Egalitarian Capitalism and Jobs with Equality, which very much lean in the direction of suggesting that, yes, uh, um, it should be a top priority uh, and trying to, to figure out the degree to which it was possible. Uh, there's a simple and straightforward fairness argument, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, that has a lot to do with the, the impact of luck. The, the more we as social scientists learn, the more we, I think we can say that morally arbitrary factors play a huge role in determining who ends up where on the income, or if you will, wealth ladder, and therefore uh, most of the disparity in, in incomes, and this is true of wealth as well, is, uh, is undeserved from a normative point of view. That's a, a strong argument for having less income inequality and wealth inequality rather than more. Um, the, the most commonly invoked argument these days, though, in favor of reducing income inequality tends to be, tends to have to do with its consequences for other things that we value or want in a good society. Uh, and 
there are uh, both conclusions and hypotheses suggesting these days that everything from health to economic growth to democracy to trust to happiness to education and, and much, much more to economic crises, that all of these things are harmed or made worse or, uh, or more or less likely by income inequality. This is just a, a very small sampling of the, the books and in the case of this uh, it was a nice movie that Robert Reich and a collaborator put together um, explaining or making this, uh, this argument. Um, I'm, I'm not so convinced that income inequality has in fact had a, a strong effect on a lot of the outcomes uh, that are suggested by, uh, by this literature recently. I do believe that uh, the evidence suggests that it has had an impact within the United States on middle class income growth. I think it slowed middle class income growth and I think it's probably had an impact, although we don't really know how large, on inequalities uh, or disparities in things like education, health, family formation, family stability, happiness. Probably it's reduced residential mixing or increased residential segregation. Um, but most of the, the hypotheses which have to do with income inequalities effect on the average level or aggregate level of health, education, economic growth, uh, and so on, I, I don't think that uh, we have evidence that convinces me anyway that there is a, a causal effect or at least a, uh, a strong causal effect. And for some of these, the problem is simply that we don't have much evidence at all, but for others, it's that I, I think contrary to what is, is often and frequently suggested these days, the evidence doesn't really support the hypothesis. Um, and so here I wanna, and, and this is how I'll close, I wanna uh, just throw out a suggestion that we think a little bit, if you believe that uh, reducing income inequality should in fact be uh, at or near the top of uh, the priority list for policymakers. Um, I want to suggest that we think a little bit about what we might learn from the, the Nordic countries. And this is part of the reason why I highlighted them in, in some of the earlier graphs. These countries arguably, I think, have really excelled at achieving a lot of the things that we want in a, a good society. Everything from economic security, high living standards for the least well-off, and quality of opportunity. Those are all Rawlsian or what uh, I in a recent book called Expanded Rawlsian Outcomes, but also freedom, both uh, the negative freedom in the Isaiah Berlin sense and also the positive freedom or capabilities in the March Ascends framework. Uh, innovation, uh, these countries have done really well at uh, allowing people to balance work and family and leisure, and also happiness or life satisfaction, including, by the way, among immigrants. There's a, a good piece in the World Happiness Report from I believe 2018 or 2019, which uh, accumulates data from the Gallup World Poll uh, specifically on immigrants and interestingly shows that immigrants tend to be more satisfied with their lives in the Nordic countries than, uh, than in most others. So it's not just the native born population. These, those countries have struggled a little bit with immigrant Im uh, integration um, and in some cases uh, not been especially welcoming. Uh, but even so, uh, immigrants tend to say that they're happier and more satisfied. Um, all right, so uh, what are the implications for how we should think about inequality? Well, um, these are countries with low inequality, at least when uh, income inequality, at least within the bottom 99%. But, um, but as I mentioned before, we've seen rises in income inequality in the Gini coefficient or 90-50 ratio or 50-10 ratio in the, the Nordic countries recently. And when we look at the top 1% share, um, they're now, because of the, the rises in the last 40 years or so, they're now up to a point not too far below where the United States was at its low point, its historic low point in 1979. So if you, if you think the United States was a high inequality country uh, around 1980, even before the rise that occurred, then you probably think the Nordic countries today are either already high inequality countries or not too far from that. Furthermore, when we look at wealth, and I haven't focused on wealth here, but when we look at wealth, the Nordic countries, according to the most recent data, um, have among the highest levels. Um, and interestingly, just as an aside, 
if you calculate the number of billionaires per capita per population, Sweden and Norway actually have higher, um, uh, higher rates than the United States does. So here's a, a chart showing top 1% share income inequality along the horizontal axis uh, and wealth inequality along the vertical axis. And um, Finland is pretty low on wealth inequality, but Denmark, Sweden, and Norway are have among the highest levels uh, of all the rich longstanding democratic countries. The United States is you know, off on a planet by its own, uh, not surprisingly. These are data as of around 2014 or so. Um, so what, did, what should we make of this? Well, um, partly this and partly other considerations, my growing pessimism about the degree to which we can, at least in the short or even intermediate run, successfully uh, reduce income and maybe wealth inequality, but also partly the, the recent Nordic experience has led me to, to rethink how vital uh, reducing income inequality is. Of course, everybody can make up their own mind about this. Uh, but I will just say that I'm less convinced, less persuaded than I was 10 or 15 years ago that it uh, should be a core objective for policymakers. I certainly think that it would be better here in the United States if there were less income and wealth inequality. Uh, but even here, I think there are 10 probably more things that uh, if I were policy czar, uh, that I would put ahead of inequality reduction on a priority list for policymakers. So I will stop there. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, again, it was quite a quick surface gloss uh, here are some additional readings that if you want to explore more, you could uh, consult. Some are short, some are longer. All of them have lots and lots of references to, uh, to a, a good bit of, of other work that you might find helpful.